Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this week's Learn with Lorna. I'll pause for a second, as I usually do, to let people join us. But if um, a couple of people could just say that they can see and hear me after last week's technological debacle, that would be uh, fab. Thank you. Perfect. Hi, Tanya. Excellent, Fiona. Thank you very much. Uh, so, yes, welcome uh, to this week's Learn with Lorna, the 51st uh, in the, the series. Um, my name, if those of you, uh, if there's anyone there who has who's not watched any of these before, my name is Lorna Steele and I'm the Community Engagement Officer for the Highland Archive Service. The Highland Archive Service it has four offices across the Highlands. We have uh, the Hub Centre in Inverness, the Highland Archive Centre. We have Nuclear, the, uh, Nucleus and Nuclear and Caithness Archives in Wick, Lochaber Archive Centre in Fort William, and Sky and Lochalsh Archive Centre in Portree. And together, the four of them make up the Highland Archive Service. Uh, this series, if you're new to it, um, and if anyone is watching for the first time, say um, say hello. It's always really interesting to me when I see, when I look back through the comments afterwards to see people still uh, kind of stumbling across us for the first time and, and joining us. And that's really nice, um, as well as all of the names that I'm getting used to seeing most days. It's uh, lovely. So, yeah, this series was um, created uh, a year ago, nearly uh, at the start of uh, the lockdown in the UK, really just to as a way of, of showing some of the collections that we hold, introducing people in their own homes to some of the collections that we look after uh, in the hope that it would um, fire your en enthusiasm about the, the records that we look after and um, maybe share some of the different things that can be done with our collections, some of the different types of things we look after. Before I go into this week's subject, a reminder that this series is brought to you by High Life Highland at no cost to the viewer that High Life Highland is a charity registered in Scotland and that there's no payment or subscription required to take part in these Learn with Lorna talks. Uh, but if you're able to donate towards our work, we very much appreciate that. And thank you so much to those of you who have done so. It really um, it really does make a difference to me and to us. Uh, it really is very, very much appreciated. So thank you so much. This month, uh, March, we've been looking at the theme of its stories and illustrations. And now I'm laughing because Stuart has written hi from Dampshire, which implies it's raining in Hampshire. So I'm very sorry for that. Um, this month, we've been looking at the theme of stories and illustrations. So the first one, we looked at authors in the collections, um, which was a really fun one to put together and to write. And last week, we looked at the story of Mary Vore, the poet and writer from the Isle of Skye. And thank you so much to, for all your comments and um, responses to last week's talk in particular, we've uh, we've hit I think about um, five and a half thousand views for last week's talk. So it's um, been one of the really popular ones, which is nice for us to know that that Marivore's story is uh, being heard. And this week we're looking at the letters and drawings of David Barragill Keith, and this is a collection that's held in the Nuclear and Caithness Archive in Wick. I hope you can see this. I have done some rearranging of my uh, entire house to try and get the screen propped up so that you can see um, uh, some of David Barragill Keith's pictures and uh, sketches and caricatures going past. So I hope you're able to, to see some of those. David Barragill Keith was born in Thurso in March of 1891. So. Uh, inadvertently, we've got another, nearly another anniversary, about 130 years ago that he was born. And he was born to his parents, Peter and Katie Varigal Keith. And he had a, an older sister called Christina. And throughout the letters, he refers to um, Tiny or Teeny. So we assume that that is Christina. His father was a solicitor, a well-known family in Thurso. He was a notary, public and solicitor and seems to have been a bit of a character himself as his father, Peter, because he was still working in the business, the family business office, um, up and every day until the age of 86. I've spoken before about um, the Hetty Munro collection, 
and uh, in back in December. And this Christina Barrigal Keith is another um, fantastic, um, another fantastic strong Caithness woman. So although this talk is about David Barrigal Keith and, and the collection relating to him, I wanted to just touch on um, a, for a moment on Christina. Um, Christina went to uh, Edinburgh University. She graduated in 1910 with uh, first class honours in Latin, Greek and classical archaeology. After leaving Edinburgh University, she went on to study at Cambridge University. She then taught, in the, during the First World War, Christina then taught English and other languages to soldiers behind enemy lines during World War One, which um, is um, it's, it's not unique, but it's it's remarkable and interesting and deserves to be noted. And she wrote a memoir about her experiences, both of the First World War and uh, of the army's education system. So, as I say, the collection is about David Barrigal Keith, but I wanted to touch on um, Christina Keith as well, just because um, I think these these kind of little stories need to be noted. Uh, Jenny, I'm seeing your question. Where is Old Reiki? I'm sure someone else will respond to you, but Old Reiki is Edinburgh. Um, but I'm sure that uh, someone will get back to you about that as well. David uh, Barrigal Keith went to Miller Academy, so uh, in Caithness, and then went on. In 1908, he followed his um, his sister to Edinburgh University, and he studied there between uh, 1909 and 19. 14 and he studied law as would uh, perhaps be expected given the family business. I mentioned that Christina Keith wrote her uh, wrote memoirs about her time about her experiences of the army's education system about her time during the first world war and that literary ability was also in her brother because he wrote an autobiography about, and it included uh, references to his times at Edinburgh University and referred to how he felt the first day he stood in Old College uh, in Edinburgh, University of Edinburgh, and I'm sure maybe some of the Edinburgh people watching will uh, identify with this. If anyone's on the ball, they can throw a picture in of, uh, of Old College. Um, and he talked about standing in Old College, University of Edinburgh, 1909, and saying, I felt inexperienced and immature, such a, a long way from Thurzo. And I think um, that's something that will be experienced with, with any of us who've gone away to study or work or um, just that feeling of, of being in a new place, feeling like you're suddenly in a big place when you've been familiar, when it's been a, a smaller place that's formed you. But also he talked about his sense that this was his moment of freedom, that although it was um, intimidating, this was his moment away from his hometown, the family business, uh, a small area and going into a new world. And I think, as is the case for so many people, and this is why we all, I think, feel particularly sorry for, for students starting university at the moment, um, studying, of course, forms part of the university experience, of course it does, but the, so also do all the extra things that, that go on uh, around, um, around going to university or going to college. And he talked about the impact on him of working, uh, walking on the Firth of Forth, uh, walking in Cramond and the Blackford Hills, and just those kind of formative experiences of studying, but also existing in a new place. And he talked about spending his weekends strolling up and down Princess Street. And he mentions meeting and uh, coming across Theodore Napier, who, if we go way, way back to the beginning, when I did uh, one of these sessions on fake news and reliable sources, I touched a little bit on the story of Theodore Napier, who was an Australian, who um, was a kind of passionate believer in the Scotland of uh, a few hundred years ago and would always dress in full Highland dress. And, and so uh, it's interesting to see that link in that David Barrigal Keith talking about seeing him striding up and down Princes Street in full Highland dress. I wanted to read to you just a little, um, a couple of sentences that he wrote describing uh, something to do with his university experience and that feeling of being thrown from Caithness into a city. 
And he says, was it any wonder when we were all so cheap by jowl with such outstanding scholars as our professors that many students, not content with attending their only their own classes, drifted in on occasion to the lectures of others, simply to listen in admiration to a master mind intelligently lighting the way around some enthralling theme, which I think is probably the ultimate compliment any university lecturer would want to get, people going in just to hear them sharing their knowledge and bringing enlightenment to a subject. I think that really demonstrates a thirst for knowledge and a thirst for learning new skills, learning new abilities and pushing beyond um, what was expected of him. And it's interesting that at the same time that he was uh, studying law at Edinburgh University, he also studied drawing at Edinburgh College of Art and then went on to study painting at the uh, Academy de la Cluse in Paris, which was a sort of um, Itali uh, atelier um, painting school. And while he was at university, he started this habit. He may have done this before, if so, I'm unaware of it, but started this habit of sketching lecturers and tutors. And these ones that are coming up just now actually are from his student days. Obviously, this is a military one, but we'll come back to it. But you'll see them come round again. And he started sketching his lecturers and other tutors and other students and himself. And what I love about this was he did it for the purpose of, he, on the first page, which will come round, he's done a self-portrait, a self-caricature, and he's written next to it. The point of creating this book is to keep very fresh in my memory the splendid years I spent at Edinburgh University. And I've touched a few times through the course of this series on the fact that I was at Edinburgh University. And when I left, one of my flatmates, who I'm still very close friends with, had created a collage for me. And I thought about propping it up to, to show the um, comparison, created a photo collage for me. And it's called Edinburgh University, The Wonder Years. And it has pictures of friends, pictures of lecturers, pictures of buildings. There's a picture of old college in it. Um, and it's interesting to me that, that I went there over a hundred years after D.B. Keith did, but that that um, desire to, to keep those memories fresh and to keep the, the people's faces as they were then uh, kind of in, enshrined in your memory is a, a nice comparison. What I like about his university sketches are each of them includes a short biography about the person. So he would sketch the person and then write a little bit about them and some thoughts about that person, either written by himself or written by the subject. And they just say, some of them say, um, this, this lad when I met him was a typical, uh, the typical image of a Scottish student. And he was, uh, he's a son of, a typical son of the manse, things like that. But an example I wanted to share with you, and I, I hope it, if I clock it coming round, I will point it out, um, was that of Daniel Horace Georgeson. And he was also from Caithness, he was from Wick. And among the notes on the Georgeson sketch, um, D.B. Keith had written a little bit about uh, the, where, they'd, where they'd met, the first time they'd met, what he was studying and so on. But then Georgeson himself has, has been asked to kind of add a comment onto it, if you want. And he, Georgeson had written, and forgive my language, it's not mine, it's Georgeson's, uh, had written, my own opinion of myself is that I'm a bloody fool, but mine is the endeavour to attain high legal distinction as the Lord Advocate of Scotland. So he had written, so these are some of the student uh, sketches. So Georgeson had said that his dream and his desire was to end up being uh, the Lord Advocate. I'm going to hesitate just for a second because I think he'll come onto the screen in just, this is him, this is the page with Georgeson. So yeah, he says, my, my aim is to be attain high legal uh, distinction as Lord Advocate. And when I was reading this, I thought, oh, right, excellent. And, you know, did, did he go on to become it? But then across the top of that was written, killed. It's the same tragedy that we come back to so many times through the records of that life cut short in the First World War and that potential cut short. Um, Georgeson was aged 24 when he died in 1918. He was a captain in the um, in the Seaforth Highlanders. And many of them, of course, because of the time 
frame that he was studying, many of them include that reference to what their fate was in the war, whether they served with distinction, whether they were killed, whether they were injured. So D.B. Keith graduated for, uh, with his law degree in Edinburgh University uh, in 1912 and then went on to complete his solicitor's training in 1914. And of course, that timing meant that he immediately became embroiled in the First World War. And I'll touch on that after I've given you a reminder that this series is brought to you by High Life Highland at no cost to the viewer. That High Life Highland is a charity registered in Scotland and that there's no payment or subscription required to take part in these events but if you're able to donate, then we really appreciate that. So as I said, he finished all his training, qualified in 1914, and with that huge, all of that generation just kind of growing into adulthood and into what they can, uh, what they can do with their lives, they get hit with the First World War. We know about his World War I experiences because we hold a copy of his autobiography and we hold a, a, a selection of letters that he wrote to his mum during the First World War. While he was fighting, and the same as while he was at university, D.B. Keith sketched the people he served alongside, and you're starting to see some of these coming up now, these um, sketches of men he served alongside military leaders, uh, battalion leaders, and so on. And the sketches were, for, but for private circulation, we have copies of those of sketches that were produced by the circulation. So you can see on this one, drawings by D.B. Keith, Lieutenant, and then it says um, that they were produced for public, uh, for private circulation. So how did he go about serving in the war? Well, on the 2nd of August 1914, which was of course just a few days before Britain officially entered the war and declared war on Germany, uh, Keith applied for a commission in the Special Reserve. He was initially turned down because he was nine stone in weight and they thought that that was, um, it was it didn't meet the physical requirements and so he failed the physical test. I'm sure somebody will be able to interpret what uh, nine stone is in kilos for me. Um, so that was the August. I find this very, very striking that that was the August. They said, no, you're not up to the physical standard we require people to be, but by September, the demand for men had increased by such an extent that he was accepted. And he was accepted into the 12th Scottish Rifles, and you'll see that name coming by in some of these uh, drawings. It's interesting that he described the, the 12th Scottish Rifles as the finest regiment by far in the British Army, and then goes on to say, although admittedly I'd never heard of them before I joined, but that um, that loyalty that comes out of serving uh, in, in that kind of situation together. He describes the the, uh, the battalion as a motley crew. He says that there were men there from Canada, from Hong Kong, from the West Indies, from Australia. There were boys as young as 14. The people in charge had kind of turned a blind eye to it because they needed the, the bodies. And there were Boer War vet veterans in there as well. So, a, as he says, a, a motley crew, a real mix of people in uh, the 12th Scottish Rifles. And initially they went to Tain for training. And you can imagine coming uh, from Caithness, going to Tain, you think, well, this is this is fine. <laughs> and he describes his time there and he says, um, you know, we do a bit of square bashing. And then when we're finished with that, um, we fill our time by going for walks and snoozing in the sun. And he says, we sing lustily, if not melodiously, um, which I, I, I live with someone who uh, operates under a similar rule, so I, I feel for the people who were next to him. And he was stationed in Bayfield House. As the, the, the regiment or battalion grew, they, they broadened out into the wider area. He talks about the poor plumbing that was happening in the, uh, the that they had to live with at Bayfield House and that they had canvas baths that they had to construct in front of the fire and that they had to dig trench toilets to be able to to use toilets so it's not um you know it's not all easy and it's not all fun but he talks about the fact that they're putting on plays they're skating they're um going bathing in the the sea or in the water uh, they're playing golf and he says our days just went pleasantly by 
But then that, of course, didn't last for long. And in October 1915, he was posted to the Western Front. The fact that it was October 1915 is significant because the end of the Battle of the Battle of Lewes was coming to an end. The Battle of Lewes had taken a huge toll of men and had taken particularly on the Highland regiments, the Cameron Highlanders, the Seaforths. And so there was a need to replace those uh, those men. If anyone remembers uh, the week where I spoke about Malcolm Blaine, and I know that certainly people have been in touch with me about that one as being an emotional and one that touched them, they'll know that Malcolm died at the Battle of Lewes. And so it was because of the death of people like Malcolm Blaine that the next kind of tranche of people had to go out and fill those gaps, which is you know where we where we talk about the cannon fodder. Um, Fiona, I've just seen that you that you think I'm freezing. Is anyone else? Uh, is it restored? I'll keep talking, assuming that all is well. But um, so I wanted to read to you the first letter that we have in this collection from David Barrigal Keith writing back to his mother. Dear mother, I have arrived here on my way to France. We got word late on Thursday evening that we were ordered off. We had no previous warning of any kind. There are several rumours of war. One is that we are to make a new landing at Ostend, another that no more drafts are to be sent across later this year as Kitchener wants all the men across now. Whatever the reason of this sudden bustle is, I don't know. I only know that the Tain crowd are here too, and from everywhere there are crowds of officers, so it may be that the hour has struck when Kitchener and Joffrey have determined to make the beginning of the end. Personally, I fear not. It seems to me that things are pretty black. What is a gain of 200 or even 600 yards or even a mile or two miles? If we have only made them give ground, then we've gained nothing in the wide world. The time will be when one or other drives a wedge clean through the other's line, then the war will be decided. Meantime, I must close. You might make up my comforter and balaclava helmet, two pairs of socks, one or two pairs of woolen gloves, and send them when I know my address. You might also get Donny to send me every week 50 gold-plated cigarettes as soon as I'm settled. Meantime, hoping everyone is well, and don't worry too much as worry won't help. With love to all from D.B. Keith. It's um, an interesting thing. I find that he he often writes that in his letters to his mum. You know, don't worry, it's fine. I mean, you know, my mum worries when I drive home late at night. I can't imagine if I was in a war zone saying, you know, I don't worry, I'm fine. Um, Going into the other letters, and there are, you know, a, a large selection of these letters, he talks about just this is just some some kind of snapshots of some of the things he mentions. He talks about the constant sound of guns in the distance of that being his background noise all the time, constant noise of guns. His feeling that the war probably will be a long one and that at the end it will be politicians that decide it and not soldiers. He says, you know, that basically the soldiers are there fighting but it's not going to be this is not going to be a, a war that's won by one big military push it's going to be a war their politicians decide to finish it he talks about meeting up with georgeson uh, who of course he was at university with he writes home to request magazines and cigarettes and food please can you parcel up venison and fresh uh, meat and send it to us so that we can get away from this endless salted bully beef It's interesting, he writes a lot about his feeling that he's a fighter and that he'll overcome this and that he'll tackle whatever he's is thrown at him. Um, and I'll read you an extract that kind of refers to that in a second. But he talks about the, the mud, the constant, that, that image we have of the First World War, of the muddy trenches and the, um, the suffering that that involved. He talks about that and about your clothes being clogged with mud. But what I find very interesting and actually quite challenging, as I was writing my notes, I was quite challenged by how I would convey this, um, was he talks about the character building nature of being at war. He describes it as glorious and topping. And this is man and ingenuity against mere climate, nature and the enemy. And there's a lot of that kind of 
as as was quite common, I think, at the start of the war, that that kind of um, boy's own spirit of adrenaline. And I've come across this in another, other few other collections, but particularly one which uh, stays in my mind, where he talks about this being, you know, such a glorious adventure, and it's also fun. He mentions the fact that he's had to bury bodies and that he's amazed by how well he can cope with it. He doesn't seem to find it anything um, too difficult. And he talks about the sound of the pipes playing and the importance of the pipes going out in front to, to rally morale and um, evoking memories of home and making you, you know, remember what you're fighting for and those sorts of things. He talks about, again, about the mud, saying that he hasn't had a change of clothes. Uh, he's had his clothes off only once in a month to have a bath. So I wanted to read another little extract from a letter he wrote back to his mother. He says, we're in a quiet place here, but every day and night you can hear big guns booming just a continuous rumbling, something like the bubbles on boiling toffee, some big and some small. It's rather an absurd metaphor, but it expresses what I mean, a sort of sultry series of eruptions. And at night, flashes blink for a second across the sky. Aeroplanes often come buzzing around. A series of trains with unearthly shrieks of agony in lieu of whistles and proceeding at a mild walking pace, lugging interminable trucks puff off across the level crossing just as one wants to cross it. Occasionally motor buses, Red Cross or otherwise, a few French policemen or a cyclist or two flip past. Otherwise things are usual. There are rumours pretty nearly always uh, that we are being moved the next day, sometimes to the trenches and, and we look with a kind of questioning wonder at the flashes across the sky, sometimes farther back. And we think of theatres and pleasant billets, but so far neither has eventuated and we're still pegging away here. And it's not so bad. We had a church service today to the sound of guns. It's all new and the experience of this war will, if I come through it all right, make a tremendous difference in me. It will drive me insane or it will be the making of me. He went on to become the adjutant of the battalion. He wrote that he would have more pay more comfort and less danger, but still enough danger to have a share of the honour. Um, and as I say, overall, I find that the tone of these letters quite um, buoyant. They're adrenaline filled. It's, and I, I think, and you know, maybe you can share your opinions on this, but I think there was that feeling at the, the in the beginning of the war that this was a, you know, a, a new world. You were going to see new places. It was all unknown. We hadn't seen a conflict like this before, so there was no kind of residual community memory of of that of what this could be like and it's full of youth and full of energy um and a bit of bravado and one of the letters says you know there are indications this war will be over within three months uh, and, and he's sort of saying to his mum i'm quite confident about that the war will be over in about three months but what i find very interesting to note was that in his autobiography which is obviously written later looking back he says i came home sick and tired in the middle of January 1917, having served continuously in the trenches from September 1915 onwards. And there's, when he returned, he spent some time in hospital in Glasgow. He was there for a few months. Uh, and then in June 1917, he rejoined. Again, he went, or he went to Nig, which he had done briefly the first time, and then back to France. But this time he went on to serve in the judge advocates department and became the judge advocate dealing with court martials. So he, using his legal uh, expertise, did court martials for desertion, for murder, for drinking on duty, that sort of thing. And I wanted to read a bit from his last letter to his mother that we have, which was written in um, October 1918. And it's interesting that that initial sort of I don't want to say lack of fear because I believe there was fear there, but that um, kind of overt courage uh, is has been tempered a little bit. That that slight feeling of enthusiasm, and I don't know if that's the experiences of what had, what he'd seen, seeing people dying, um, or whether that's just something that comes a bit with maturity, maybe. Um, but he writes in this letter, and and he does talk a lot about the Bosch. Um, so I will be referring to that, not that it's a term I like to use. Um, my dear mother, not much has happened since I last wrote, still in the same place, 
and now peaceable as ever. It's rather an interesting place too. We've got a big Bosch cemetery here and it could easily compare with any cemetery I've seen anywhere for arrangement, care and beauty. Everything is of course primitive, but there's a lot of good solid architecture about the place and two very fine monuments, not to anybody in particular, but just the cemetery. The whole thing is worked in a design with boxwood borders, massive crosses and green shrubs. There are several of our fellows buried here and their graves and crosses are also excellently looked after. I've never seen any of our cemeteries to come within miles of this and it makes me rather ashamed of our stories about the Bosch boiling down corpses for oil when we see how well he has looked after his cemeteries. And I think that's just, um, like I say, that there's an, an understanding there maybe of the wider impact this conflict has had um, and you know it's, it's much less clear-cut I think than, than maybe people thought when they first went to serve. And he finishes that particular letter off something which is, is always current. He says there's no, no news really, uh, I've just been filling in some paper uh, as I never managed to do, as I never managed to write enough. So he's sort of saying I'm, I'm just filling in this letter because I don't know what else to write to you but he says I hear there's lots and lots of influenza about and I hope nobody's got any. If anyone gets it I suppose it will be teeny tiny and I hope she does and if she does I hope she looks after herself and isn't just silly about it because there's a good deal of fatality with this one isn't there? Which again just uh, that current thing of things not really changing uh, in the world. Um, you know don't, don't be silly about this if you get it because it's uh, it's serious. So as I say, that last letter was written October 1918, so that was obviously not long before uh, the armistice was signed. And he describes receiving the telegram that, uh, in his autobiography, describing receiving the telegram that informed him about the armistice. He says, flares went up everywhere and at 11am there was silence for the first time since August 1914. I think um, those of us who haven't been in that situation take that silence for granted sometimes. Uh, at the end of the war he returned to Thurso and he practiced as a solicitor and a bank agent, a factor for the family business in Thurso and then when World War II broke out he returned to active service again and this time from 1940 to 1944 he served as a staff captain in the legal affairs department. Uh, at Orkney and Shetland Defence Headquarters. So again, using his legal training to uh, to serve the country. And I always, I'm always i always struck by that when I come across or I'm researching anybody whose life covers that kind of time period, that that's the two wars generation. You know, you've, you've spent your 20s fighting a war and then you've spent your 40s fighting a war as well. Um, in 1945, he returned after the Second World War to Thurso and resumed his legal practice and eventually went on to be appointed Sheriff's, Sheriff Substitute of Orkney uh, in 1946 and he continued to hold that post until his retirement in 1968. You can see, I hope you've enjoyed seeing the sketches going past, he continued that love uh, of drawing and of painting and if there are people here watching who are familiar with, with D.B. Keith, then that is possibly why they will know him. Uh, he was a member of the Caithness Arts Society. He exhibited at the Royal Scottish Academy and he exhibited at the Royal Scottish Society for Painters and Watercolour. Um, so uh, a real, that, that the skill and ability and desire to capture things continued. And there's artwork of his in Caithness in the Leith Arts Centre um, his, some of his pictures of Thurso Harbour and uh, Skerry Harbour and, and different things and also within Stromness Museum and Orkney Museum because of course those those connections to Orkney. D.B. Keith died in uh, 1979 and if you do have any memories of him then please do um, please do share them when we finished talking today it's always nice when we cover and I said that with Hetty Munro and some others as well when we talk about people whose life comes within uh, our memories then that's uh, it's really interesting to see the both sides of that uh, story. I hope you've enjoyed that I really hope I didn't freeze too much um, and uh, yes I hope you've enjoyed looking through some of the pictures of uh, D.B. Keith's life and hearing a little bit about him and about his sister uh, Christina Keith. 
I hope you can join me next week. Next week, we are looking at um, superstitions, myths and legends within the collection. And I can tell you there's all sorts of fun things that have come up in that. So I really hope you can join me next week for that. A reminder that this series is brought to you by High Life Island at no cost to the viewer. That High Life Island is a charity registered in Scotland and that there's no charge or subscription required to take part in watching these films. But thank you so much for joining me and I'll speak to you next week.